All right, let's go ahead and get started with the prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly and merciful Father God, we thank you for giving us the amazing grace of salvation and allowing us to become your children. Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to be in the church as well, where we can learn more about your love and grace, more of your words. We ask that you can allow us to um, gather our hearts together at this time so that we can truly understand your words clearly. Uh, today, specifically, we'll be learning about the judgment seat of Christians. We just ask that you can be with each and every one of us at this moment so that we can have a clear understanding of this topic so that we can glorify your name to a further extent. Uh, we just ask once again that you are with us from the beginning of this time to the end. Lord, we thank you for all the things that you have given to us, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's open up our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 to 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. Let me read it for us. It says, We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Yes, today we're going to be talking about the judgment seat of Christians, the judgment seat of Christ. This is a place where um, Christians, only Christians, will partake in and they will be judged according to their actions. And so today we just want to understand this topic of the judgment seat of Christians, um, what it is and who is going to be partaking in it. Um, how is it that we have to live knowing that we also will be partaking in this judgment seat? With that being said, um, as we know and as we have learned continually throughout this, um, throughout the, um, our, our Christian lives, we know that after we die, there is going to be a judgment. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is very clear. It says, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, uh, the judgment. As human beings, we are un unable to avoid this um, destiny of death. Um, not only that, but after we die, the Bible tells us that there is a judgment. Um, there are going to be two types of judgment because that is what the Bible talks about. There's going to be the judgment seat of Christ, which we will talk about heavily today, and we have the uh, great white throne judgment. Um, and this is actually what we talk about all the time in the Bible seminars, uh, the great white throne judgment. Um, this is the judgment seat where sinners will all appear before Jesus Christ and will be judged according to the sins that they've committed in their lives. And we're able to find this in Revelation chapter 20. So let's take a look there together. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Let me read. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So here in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, this is referring to the 
great white throne judgment. And this is the place where only sinners will be partaking in to be judged according to their works. Um, in fact, because of the sins that they're going to be judged um, for, um, it's going to really determine whether they go to a, a more painful place in hell or a less painful place in hell. Of course, regardless of um, how many sins you've committed, if you committed sin, if you are a sinner after you die, you will be partaking in this great white throne judgment. This is only a place for those people who did not believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. This is very, very important for us to understand. So in the end, all those who partake in this judgment specifically, the great white throne judgment, will all end up in the lake of fire. They will all end up in hell. As I just mentioned, the second judgment seat is the judgment seat of Christ, and this is what we'll be talking heavily about today. These two places are drastically different places. These are um, opposite places. The great white throne judgment, all those people who partake in their, that judgment will end up in hell. However, those who attend or partake in the judgment seat of Christ will all end up in heaven. Now, what will determine whether I appear before the great white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ? It's whether, obviously, I am saved or not. In other words, whether I will go to heaven is decided in this world right now. If I receive salvation, then I will appear in the judgment seat of Christ. If I do not receive salvation, then I will naturally end up in the great white throne judgment. Um, there are many people who have this false stereotypical image of the judgment seat. Some people think that everyone, they will die, and then they will all end up in this judgment seat. And God, he will have us come up one by one, and he will weigh our deeds good ones and bad ones, and see whether our good we, they, deeds outweigh our bad ones or our bad ones outweigh our good ones. And determine, um, depending on this, he'll either send us to heaven or hell. Uh, but that's not the case. Uh, we know that when we look at the scriptures carefully, we know that whether we end up in the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, this is going to be determined while we are here in this earth. And so have I truly received salvation? Have I become born again? Uh, these are the same thing, obviously. Um, it, it's that is going to determine whether I go to the one's judgment seat or the other. Um, specifically, the Bible, it also talks about two types of resurrections. Uh, let's take a look at this verse as well. Let's go to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. It is John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Let me read. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So those people who do good, they will partake in the resurrection of life. Whereas there will be another people who do not do good, these people who do evil, they will appear in the resurrection of condemnation. And so what determines whether they will go to the resurrection of, um, good, uh, re of life or resurrection of condemnation, it really just depends on whether I did good or not. But we need to think about this. What does this actually mean? Does this mean morally good things? If I do morally good things in this world, will I go to the condemnation of life? Of course not. That's not what it's talking about. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, verse 12, it says they have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. No one in front of God can say to him that he lived a morally good life because everyone is a sinner in front of God. There's no one who does good. And so then, what does this mean in John chapter 5, verse 29? Those people who do good. This means those people who do good in front of God. In front of God. We must do good in front of God. In other words, those people who do good in front of God are those people that believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ and those people who ultimately receive salvation. That is what is good in God's sight. That is what he deems good. And so when you're able to do this, you're able to wear the clothes of righteousness, the garments of salvation, and you're able to ultimately 
go to heaven, go to this, partake in this resurrection of life. And so the difference here is whether someone believed in the atoning work of Christ or not. He did good or he did evil. If they believed in the atoning work, once again, they have passed from death into life. They will partake in this resurrection of life. In John chapter 3, verse 18, it makes it very clear. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. John chapter 5, verse 24 as well, it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. This person shall not come into the judgment that God has planned to pour upon people, but he has passed from death into life. The reason why this is, is because if you truly believe in the atoning works of Christ, what ends up happening is that you believe the fact that Jesus Christ, he has taken the judgment for me. The wrath upon him was poured on him, right? The wrath for me, rather, was poured upon Jesus Christ. Where? On the cross. On the cross. In other words, he who believes is not condemned because Jesus was condemned for them. Therefore, he who believes has done good and will thus ultimately avoid the great white throne judgment, the condemnation, uh, the, rather the resurrection of condemnation. If those, there are people obviously who will not believe in this and they will be condemned because they did not believe naturally. The judgment, the wrath upon Christ was not for them in other words and then that is why they will end up in the great white throne judgment in the end. And so they'll be judged for their sins. They'll be judged according to their works, according to their deeds. And so it all just depends on whether I did good or not. Did I do good in believing in the atoning work of Jesus Christ and receive salvation? If I did, then I will appear in the resurrection of life at the judgment seat of Christ. However, if I have not believed in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, then ultimately the thing that's going to be um, planned for me is me going to the resurrection of condemnation and going in front of Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment. And so doing good or bad is determined whether you receive this life of Jesus Christ or not. And so that's something that I wanted to get um, just out of the way first very clearly um, that there is two different types of judgments um, after um, humans pass away. If you're truly saved, if you believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, then you will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. If you have not believed in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, if you have not received salvation, then you will appear in the great white throne judgment. And so there are two distinct judgments after human beings pass away. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Two different types of judgment, for, depending on whether you believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. In both of these judgments, Jesus Christ himself, he will be the judge. He will be the judge. It says in John 3, 18, once again, this, um, or, um, this is not the right passage, but it says here in John of chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. I apologize for the typo. But in this highlighted part, it says, and has given him authority to execute judgment also. You see, God is the one, Jesus Christ is the one who's going to execute judgment, not only in this world, but also in heaven. In John chapter 9, verse 39, it says, and Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world. He has come to this world to judge. Not only that, here, not only here in this world, but also in heaven. And so Jesus Christ, he will be the one who's going to judge both in the judgment seat of Christ and in the great white throne judgment. So to sum up really quickly before we continue on, the great white throne judgment is for sinners while the judgment seat of Christ is for saints. Okay? If we could just split it or if we could just think about it in that way, then I think that will be very, very good. Now let's go back to 2 Corinthians. Let's take a look at this context here, why Apostle Paul um, talked about the judgment seat of Christ. And then we will take a look at the specifics of the judgment seat of Christ. Just to clarify, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 to 10 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. So this is for Christians only. This is not for um, unsaved people. But let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. And let's take a look at this context here so that we can understand this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It says here, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now here from chapter 5, verse 1, all the way to verse 7 or 8 even, we get three um, things that Apostle Paul wants to point out here. First, it's we know, right? He's saying, we know these things. Um, we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, 
a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Um, this analogy of uh, uh, using a tent for the, uh, for the body um, is, is a very appropriate one because Apostle Paul, he was, in a, he was a tent maker. And as a tent maker, he knew the ins and outs of naturally making tents. Uh, with that being said, he used the tent as an analogy. The tent is like our bodies. The people that use tents, the people that um, live in tents are sojourners, right? They're just travelers. Let's, let's think about camping, right? When we go camping, we pack a tent and then we make the tent and we, and we live in it for a couple of days or however long we want to, and then we come back home. It's not an eternal place that we're going to live. It is just a temporary place, right? Tents are not eternal places, naturally. Um, they are just temporary places. Um, so after our tents, which is our bodies, once again, he's referring to our bodies here. When our tent, our body is destroyed, we have been promised with an eternal building from God that is not built with hands, but that is eternal in heaven, right? It is a God-made building as opposed to a man-made building. And this is very important for us to understand because it is, because it is God-made, it is something that is going to truly last forever as opposed to a temporary place, right? This house will be eternal in heaven. So Paul is saying that this is something that we know um, as those people who have received salvation. Therefore, our desires are not of the temporary things of this world, but are of the eternal things of heaven. That's why right before 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And because we know that as saved Christians, we seek something greater, more eternal, as opposed to these temporal things in this world. Let's continue on here. Let's go to verses 2 to 4. We see here the second phrase that Apostle Paul wants to emphasize. It says, For in this we groan, we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. So here, two times in verses 2 and in verse 4, it talks about this groaning, right? We are groaning uh, because we want to be further clothed with this, um, this, this, um, this heavenly this heavenly um, temple, or this heavenly building, rather. And so if we take a look here in verse 2, for in this we groan, earnestly designed to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. We want to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. In other words, if we truly are saved, we earnestly desire to go to heaven. Right? Not in, in, a, in a very a negative way, right? Not in a way that we just want to die and just go there, of course, but we have a great expectation of heaven. In other words, after receiving salvation, we groan for glory. Right? After groaning for salvation, because before we received salvation, we found out that we are sinners, and thus we groaned. We cried out to God. We asked for mercy. God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. We groaned for salvation. After we received salvation, now we groan for glory, the eternal things in heaven. That is what we groan for now as Christians, is it not? Right? We want to be further clothed with the habitation which is from heaven. So how do we then as Christians know that we will go to heaven after we die? It's because the Holy Spirit is a guarantee, right? And we have this groaning because the Holy Spirit allows us to have these groanings. That's what here it, it mentioned in verse 5. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee, right? God, he has given us the Spirit as a guarantee, and this Spirit allows us to know that we truly are going to go to heaven. And also, it is a Spirit that allows us to have these groanings of greater glory in heaven. And so this is very, very important for us to understand as well. Now, let's continue on here. The last phrase or the last um, verb that he wants to talk about here is this in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. It says, So, we are always confident... We are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. So the first thing that Apostle Paul wanted to mention here in this passage was we know in verse 1. Verse 2 and 4 talks about our groaning, right? We groan for these things. And then here in verse 6 and 7, it says we are confident, right? We are always confident. In other words, we have 
boldness. We have courage as Christians in this world. This is whether we are absent from the Lord or whether we are present with the Lord. We have boldness in this world, um, even in heaven, right? This confidence, ultimately, as it says in verse 7, is what allows us to live by faith and not by sight. Even though the situations around us may be tumultuous and we might be facing many persecutions and sufferings and difficulties in our lives, the reason why we are able to be confident, bold, courageous in these type of situations is because we have faith that we're going to end up in heaven as well, right? This is all related here. Therefore, whatever sufferings or tribulations we face, we can overcome them, right? Because we know that we have an expectation, a certain expectation in heaven, right? In heaven. Thus, heaven is not simply a destination for Christians. This shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't just be a a destination, but rather heaven is a motivation for Christians. Let me repeat that. Heaven is not a destination, not only a destination for Christians, but it is a motivation for Christians. If we have heaven only be our destination and not our motivation, then we're going to live our lives in this world half-heartedly. We're going to live a life that is very lukewarm, that is very dull in God's sight. But if we use heaven, not just as a destination, not just as a, um, a thought of saying, um, yeah, you know, after I die, I'll go to heaven, so I'm just going to live my life just because I can't die. Um, this is a very terrible type of way to live as a Christian, obviously. And so as Christians, we cannot just has, have heaven as our destination, but we must have it as a motivation in our lives. This is what will truly motivate us to live a solid, uh, very passionate Christian life in front of God, right? We don't want to just do the bare minimum and go to heaven. We want to go to heaven and make sure that we are receiving many glories that God has prepared for us. And this is exactly what God would want for us as well. He doesn't want us to just live in this world, um, living for the things of this world, the temporary things of this world. No, he wants us to live for the eternal things. It is not right for Christians to only think of heaven as a destination and not a motivation. And so our heavenly abode shouldn't be just a destination that we go to, but it should be the motivation that allows us to live a faithful Christian life in front of God. We must really imagine the glory that we will receive in heaven when we get there and the um, um, pleased and, and the ecstatic face of Jesus Christ, how happy, how joyous he would be when we get there. This is what has to serve as our motivation while we live in this world as Christians. Now let's take a look at verses 8 to 10. I want us to really focus on, 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 in on this um, passage, our main passage here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. Let me look at, let's look at these verses one at a time here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 first. It says here, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Not only was Paul confident when he was living in this world, but he was also confident of not being in this world as well, right? It's okay if he was living, alive, or it's okay if he was dead. Because if he died, he knew that he would be present with the Lord, even though he would be absent from the body, right? This is not something that those who are saved can say. And this is something that we really have to think about. This is a huge grace that God, he has given to us after we receive salvation. He has allowed us to not be afraid of this concept of death. We're not afraid now of dying. Why? Because we are able to have confidence in going to heaven. This is a great grace that God, he has given to us. People in this world, they are fundamentally afraid of death. And so the concept of death um, you know, freaks them out and scares them. And even when they are on deathbeds, well, there's no one who dies in peace. But as Christians, we can. This is an amazing grace that God, he has given to us. Furthermore, if we continue to read this verse, it says that we are pleased to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, right? We all have this heart to be present with the Lord. Actually, this is one of the greatest desires of a Christian. We all want to be present with the Lord, especially when we are going through sufferings. I think this is the case. When we're going through tough times, tribulations, these persecutions in our lives, we want to be with the Lord. And that's exactly what Paul, he desired as well. He said that he was pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. He would have chosen to go to heaven, 
um, more than stay in this world. But he knew that he had a purpose in this world as well. In Philippians chapter 1, it talks about how if he was in this world, it was needful for the saints, needful for the brothers and sisters at the church of Philippi and for all Christians all over the world. And so for us, we, yes, we want to be with the Lord. We all have the desire to really be in heaven with the Lord. But when we get to heaven, what we have to realize is that there will be, or before we actually get there, there will be this judgment seat of Christ. This judgment seat of Christ. And that's our focus for today, right? This, this judgment seat of Christ. Let's take a look at verse 9. Verse 9. It says here, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Whether we are present or absent. We're present with the Lord in heaven, or we're absent from the Lord, we're, we're here in this world, whether we are in this world or we're in heaven, that's what he's saying here, whether we are alive in this world or whether we're dead and you know, we're, we're going to go to heaven, um, this is what we do, right? We make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him, right? whether present or absent. It says here, um, the beginning part of this verse, it says, therefore we make it our aim. We make it our aim. Uh, this word in Greek is philo timometha. Uh, probably butchering the word here, but this means, this is literally, what, 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 what it literally means is lover or friend of acknowledged honor. Lover or friend of acknowledged honor. Um, to be more precise, this, this means to show affection for what is personally valued or personally honored. Right? To show affection for something that you really value or something that you really honor. And perhaps another way to describe this is pursuing what has great personal value to someone to pursue something that has great personal value. So there are many things that might have great personal value for you in your lives, but if you truly desire to pursue that, then that is what it means, this, this word in, in Greek, philotimometha, right? Therefore, putting in great effort to attain this thing. So you have a high value of this thing, a high personal value of this thing, you have a high, um, you, you honor this thing very much, and so that is why you put great effort into attaining this specific thing. Um, if, if I may uh, give a quick uh, personal example, this is a very childish example, but when I was younger, uh, I would play basketball with my older brother and my father. We would play um, around the world, and you know, we would just go around the uh, basketball court and, and shoot and try to make it in. And my dad, he would make a, a deal with us, and he said, hey, if you guys win, then I'll buy you your, your favorite chips. Um, and at that time, it was Hot Cheetos. And so for me, I really wanted this Hot Cheetos. That was something that had great personal value to me. And so as a result, what is it that I did? I put in great effort to attain the hot Cheetos, right? And, I, and I, was, I was in elementary school back then, and so I tried my best to, you know, shoot and to, to beat my dad, but uh, most of the time my dad would win, uh, unfortunately, but um, that's okay because uh, he was a loving father, and that is why he bought me these other uh, chips anyway. But regardless here, um, when we take a look at this passage here, we know that this is something that we aim for, right? There is something that we aim for. We are ambitious, in other words. That's another synonym for this word in Greek. We are ambitious. And so if we continue to read this verse, it says that we make it our aim. We are ambitious. What is it that we make it, what is it that we make our aim? Or what is it that we are ambitious for? It says the last four words in this verse to be, last six, I guess, to be well-pleasing to him. To be well-pleasing to him. We want to be well-pleasing to the Lord. That is our aim. That is our goal. That is why we are ambitious. And the reason why this is, is because Christ, he died for Apostle Paul. Right? And that's why Apostle Paul, he had a great desire to repay his grace, the grace that he had rece has received, to uh, and, and, and live for the Lord. That he made it his aim to please the Lord in all circumstances. This is the reason why the sufferings and persecutions that Apostle Paul faced, none of them, it fazed him. None of them. And there was a time in, in Acts chapter 14 when he was in Lystra, and when he was in Lystra, he was preaching the gospel, and people, the Jewish people, they came there from Antioch and Iconium, and what did they do? They stoned him. Right? They dragged him out, or that they stoned him, they dragged him out the city, supposing him to be dead. Right? Supposing him to be dead, so he must have been Stoned pretty badly. Stoned with stones pretty badly. Right? But then he got back up. And he went straight back to the city and continued to preach the gospel. Why? Because he wanted to be well-pleasing to the Lord. That was his aim. That was his goal. That is what he was ambitious for. 
But this is not only applicable to Apostle Paul, of course. We, too, have received salvation, and we, too, have that yearning heart to please the Lord as well. We, too, have that yearning desire to really glorify God's name. That is our aim. That is why we are ambitious in this world. We want to glorify God's name and please Him. How can we please the Lord, then? This is the question that we have to think about, of course. I, want to, I don't want to take too much time in this section here, but we need to think about this question. How can I please the Lord? There are many, many ways as Christians that we can please the Lord. Let me just talk here about um, seven of them, just a couple, um, a couple of them here. First, by saving lost souls. This is what we know as evangelism. When we evangelize and people are able to receive salvation, there is joy in heaven. There is great joy in heaven. In Luke chapter 15, verse 7, it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. There is great joy in heaven when there is a lost soul who receives salvation after repentance. This is something that truly pleases the Lord. When we evangelize and we preach the gospel. Secondly, if you look at 3 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, um, John talks about how he was filled with joy when people walked in the truth. But do you think this is only for John? No, this is, of course, for God as well. When God, he looks at his children walking in truth, this is the greatest joy that he can, that he can have, a great joy that he can have, rather. A very great joy for God. This is what pleases the Lord when we walk in truth and when we don't walk in false cities naturally. A third thing that really pleases the Lord is when we live as light of the world and when we bear fruit. Right? When we live as light of the world and we bear, bear fruit. Even in the midst of all of our difficulties, in the midst of this dark world, if we're able to shine as light of the world, how pleased with, would, would God be with us? How joyous would he be to see us enduring and bearing fruit in the midst of all this, these tribulations? Fourthly, when we participate in preaching the gospel through materialistic means, through um, personnel means, like if we go to certain missionary trips, perhaps. Right? When we do these things as well, God, he is very, very pleased. This is what it says in Philippians chapter 4. When we live in obedience, not only to our parents, but in general to authority and to the order that God, he has ordained, this is something that pleases the Lord as well. Let me focus on this a little bit here. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Once again, this is not only to parents, but in Romans chapter 13, it also talks about how we have to submit to the government. Right? When we are submissive, when we are obedient to the authorities and orders that God, he has ordained in this world, this is something that truly pleases him as well. In Titus chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back. And so when bond servants are obedient to their masters, this is likewise pleasing in God's sight. So we need to live in obedience to authority and order. This, of course, includes the church as well. Right? When we are in the church, we need to listen to the the, the pastors of the church, the elders of the church, the officers of the church, because God, he has ordained them. He has ordained them. Lastly, at least in my list here, or sorry, second to last, is discerning the will of God and offering our bodies for that will. We need to know what God's will is. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a holy one, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to be those who are transformed by the renewing of our minds, and we need to be able to discern what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. When we are able to understand what that will of God is, when we discern what that will of God is, that acceptable will of God, then we need to offer our bodies, present our bodies as a living sacrifice that is pleasing and acceptable and acceptable to the Lord. We need to make sure that we use our bodies to glorify God's name by doing his will. Now, we need to present our bodies as a will, well-pleasing, um, as well-pleasing by discerning the will of God, as I just mentioned. And so we need to know exactly what the will of God is in our lives. If we don't know what the will of God is, and we're offering him things that are completely contrary to his will, then 
This is, it doesn't seem like it's a very beneficial thing to do. If God desires, let's say, if he wanted X from us, but we continually give him Y, um, obviously this, there's, there's a mismatch here, right? There's a mismatch in communication. I don't know what God's will is. He wants X, right? But then we're continually giving him Y. And so with that being said, we need to make sure that we can discern what the will of God is correctly so that we can please him through the offering, the presenting of our bodies. Lastly, in this list at least, um, abiding in the fellowship and abiding in the love of the Lord. This is, when we do this, uh, we are able to please the Lord as well. But the fact that we can please the Lord um, obviously means that we can displease him. Um, We can make him angry. We can make him sad. This is obviously uh, the opposite of pleasing the Lord. And as Christians, we need to really be asking ourselves, what if I'm displeasing the Lord and not pleasing the Lord? What if I'm living a self-centered life, a stubborn life, a sin-filled life? If I do so, then I will be displeasing the Lord. And so we need to be very cognizant of whether I am pleasing the Lord or not pleasing Him. This is something we need to be thinking about. We must think, what is it? that I have to do to please the Lord. Once again, let's take a look at verse 9. It says here, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. God's pleasure, God, his happiness, his joy should be our goal. We should be ambitious to make God happy in our lives. That is our greatest goal. In fact, when we go to the judgment seat of Christ after we die and we're judged judged by Jesus Christ, we're going to think, What is it that I did to please the Lord? And my turn will come soon, and it will be revealed what it is that I did to really please the Lord. And so we have to to ask ourselves, is is my greatest ambition, is my greatest goal in this life to really please the Lord? This is something that we need to really focus on. As I mentioned before, um, Apostle Paul, he was so grateful for the grace of salvation. That is why he was able to live his life being ambitious for the pleasure, the happiness of the Lord. However, if you look at this context, of course, uh, we need to know um, why Apostle Paul actually said this. The reason why Apostle Paul said that he makes it his aim, right, he must, um, he makes it his aim to please the Lord is because we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And once again, in this context, this is what Apostle Paul is talking about here. Of course, Apostle Paul was thankful for the salvation that he received, but more so in this context, he he made it his aim to be well-pleasing to the Lord because he knew that there would be a judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, here. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. It says here, we must, for we must, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not an option. It's not something that you can just opt out of. This is something that is mandatory. We all need to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For example, if if I was able to, if I were to drop this, Right? If I were to drop this, then it's going to fall, right? Naturally, because we have gravity in this world. With that being said, just like this, we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is something that's definitely going to happen. There are many verses in the scriptures that talk about the fact that we're going to stand in front of Jesus Christ and we're going to be judged by Jesus Christ in this judgment seat of Christ. And so the judgment seat of Christ will be done when the believers are all gathered together in God. We're going to go to heaven together and we're going to be judged by him at the end of our lives. And the reason why this is going to be the end of our lives is because all of our actions, all of our works must be accounted for. A simple example to this would perhaps be going to your local grocery store, going to any grocery store. Um, You go there and you you get your card or your your bag or whatever it may be, and then you fill it with whatever you're going to get. And then when do you do, when is the checkout? It's all the way at the, all the way at the end, right? You don't check out in the middle and then the rest of the things just take home for free, right? All of those things that you have put in your cart, you go to the checkout line and that is all the way at the end. And then you pay for everything at the end. Similarly, as Christians, we are going to be judged at the end of our lives. After we die or after we get raptured, we'll stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ and he will judge us according to all of our works, all of our actions, everything that we did. 
Uh, not only that, if we, since we're talking about this, uh, these grocery stores, um, in grocery stores there are cameras everywhere as well so that they can know um, if you're stealing something or you know, wh whatever it may be. Uh, similar, similarly, God, he has his eyes everywhere. He sees everything that we're doing and so every work that we do will be accounted for. Right? There's no work that will not be accounted for because God, he sees everything. Okay. And so God, he is going to judge each and every one of us at this judgment seat of Christ. And this is not something that is optional. Um, furthermore, this judgment is actually very, very necessary because of God, of, of who he is, of the characteristics of God. As we know, and as we've continually learned in the Bible seminars, we know that God, he is a just God. Of course, he is a very loving God, but he is a very just God as well. Because God is a just God, this judgment will be, is, is actually absolutely necessary. Right? Um, not only that, but because God is a just God, this just um, judgment will be absolutely fair. He's going to account for everything in our lives. Everything. So it's going to be a very fair judgment. Not only that, not only is it going to be a fair judgment, but it's going to be a very thorough judgment. Right? He's going to look at every single detail. Right? It's going to be very, very thorough. Thirdly, it's not going to be an impartial judgment. He's not going to show partiality or favoritism towards people that he liked or whatever. Right? It's all going to be impartial, this judgment is. Fourthly, um, this is going to be a very personal, uh, individualistic judgment. There's no team um, prizes here. It's all personal. It's all on an individual basis. Right? We're each going to be judged according to our works. Fifthly, it is a merciful one merciful one. And the reason why it's a merciful one is because in the end, everyone is going to receive praise. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, um, this is what it says. Um, I, don't, I don't have it on the screen, but if you can look in your Bibles with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Let me read it for us. It says here, for I, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. It says here, Then each one's praise will come from God. Each one's praise will come from God. And so, to a certain extent, we're all going to receive a certain praise, and that is why it is a very merciful, it will be a very merciful a judgment as well. God, he is a very merciful God, he is a very loving God, and he desires that we receive great glory in heaven. With that being said, we're going to all stand in front of Jesus Christ in this judgment seat of Christ, and we will be, and it says here, verse 10, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. Specifically speaking, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it gives a little bit more specific um, information in terms of what this judgment seat of Christ will look like. So let's take a look there. Since we're in 1 Corinthians, let's take a look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 11 to 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. Let me read. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so here, from verses 11 to 15, this passage here also talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Those who laid the foundation of Jesus Christ when they were in this world will partake in this judgment seat of Christ. Jesus Christ, he is our foundation, and by faith we build on top of this foundation with gold silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, as it says here. Um, once again, only those who are saved will be partaking in this judgment seat of Christ. And so this gives us a, a broader understanding of this judgment seat of Christ because if there are only saved Christians in this judgment seat, there are people that will truly build their house with gold, silver, and precious stones, while other people, they will build their houses with wood, hay, and straw. There are multiple different types of people. 
So what's the difference between gold, silver, and precious stone, and then wood, hand, straw? Um, in this context, if you look at it very, very simply, the difference is whether it can go through fire or not, right? Um, if there are sufferings, wood, hay, and straw will naturally be burned up. But gold, silver, and precious stones will not be, according to this passage. Therefore, when there are sufferings, that is when we will know that, um, whether this will truly endure on the fire or not. So we need to, as Christians, obviously not build our building with wood, hay, and straw, but we must build it with gold, silver, and precious stones. Having faith in God, um, that's how we build this building in the first place. Um, we need to have faith in God, and, and we, with faith, we need to build our house. When we have faith and do the works of God, then we can build our house with gold, silver, and precious stones. Now, there are many different ways that we can build our house with gold, silver, or precious stones. Uh, let's just talk about a couple of them. Uh, I talked a little about ways that we can please the Lord, and it's pretty similar. Um, but let's take a look at what is it that we can do to build our house with gold, silver, and precious stones. First, evangelizing, as I mentioned before as well. When we evangelize, when we preach the gospel, this is truly what it means to build our houses out of gold, silver, or precious stone. In Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 it says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. When we return people, when we turn people to righteousness, right, those people who do this will shine like the stars forever and ever. Right? This is what it means to build our house with gold, silver, or precious stone. So this is something that we need to put our efforts into. Secondly, partaking in God's work. When we partake in God's work, this is also what it means to build with gold, silver, and precious stone. It says in Matthew 10, 41, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Even if you receive a prophet or receive a righteous man, you'll receive the reward that is uh, reserved for them. Right? And so when we partake in God's work, right, when we preach the gospel together, sure it is the pastors that are preaching during the Bible seminars, but when we actively participate in the Bible seminars, we're able to receive those rewards as well, whether that's in the bathrooms, cleaning the bathrooms, whether that's making food in the kitchens, whether that's doing the service in, in the parking lot, whatever service it may be during this Bible seminar time, we also will be receiving those rewards because we are receiving the preachers in the name, in their, in, 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 uh, uh, right, uh, in, in their name. And that's why we'll receive this type of similar reward. And so this is what it means to build our houses out of gold, silver, and precious stone likewise. And so we need to actively partake in God's work. Thirdly, when we are edifying each other, this is very big as well, when we edify one another, when we help each other out, this is what it really means to build out of gold, silver, and precious stone. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, it says, And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Even a cup of cold water, you'll receive great reward. Gold, silver, and precious stone. This is how we build our houses out of these precious materials not with wood, hay, and straw. Fourthly, something that is very, very practical in our lives is obedience to the Word of God. When we are obedient to the Word of God, then we can build our houses with gold, silver, and precious stones. In Colossians 3, 23 verse 20 and 24, it says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. When we serve Him, when we obey His words, then we will receive the reward of the inheritance. We will be able to build out of these precious materials. Psalm chapter 19, verse 10 and 11 talks also about how precious the word is. It says, more to be desired, the word of God, are they than, the gold, than gold? Um, yeah, then much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Right? Great reward. We will be able to receive these great rewards. In other words, we will be able to build our houses with gold silver, and precious stones if we are obedient to the words of God. 
We need to read the Word of God, learn the Word of God together, and make sure that we obey. This is the only way that we will be able to grow in our faith lives as well, and this is the only way that we will be able to live more faithfully for the Lord when we live in obedience. Fifthly, at least here on my list, is when we endure tribulations and adversities. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, it says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecu persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. When they revile and persecute you, yes, we will be able to receive great rewards in heaven. Once again, um, this is synonymous with making, building our houses with these precious materials. Right? In this world, we have to expect tribulations. We must expect persecutions and sufferings because our Lord, He is the one that faced them as well. He was able to endure till the end. And likewise, we too must endure as well. Everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, it says in 2 Timothy 3.12. And so with that being said, we need to make sure that we likewise count the cost and endure the difficulties, the sufferings that come our way. With that being said, we need to make sure that we have the correct motivation when we live our Christian lives as well. Um, this is the way that we can truly build with gold, silver, and precious stones as well. If we don't have the right motivation while doing these five different things or the other things in the Christian life, then this is um, not pleasing in God's sight, and this is like building with wood, hay, and straw. We must have the correct motivation, the correct the, um, intention when we are um, living for the Lord. And so we need to ask ourselves, when I am serving the Lord, is my intention, my motivation, is it pure? Are my actions really being done through the help of the Holy Spirit, the power, the might of the Holy Spirit? Is my zeal based on the Word of God, or is my zeal based on um, something else? So, once again, my motivation must be correct in God's sight. You see, when we go to heaven, our house will be the result of what we built on this earth. Um, in terms of our actions and how we live for the Lord. And so some might be when they go to heaven, they might see their house um, that they built while they were in this world through their actions, and they will say, oh, I'm very satisfied with this um, nice house. It's a beautiful house that is filled with gold, silver, and precious stone. On the other hand, there will be others, maybe many, many others, who will look at their house and regret it and say, I should have done more. Like, I should have lived well. Why didn't I live for the Lord? Why didn't I serve the brothers and sisters? Why didn't I preach the gospel more, more passionately? So instead of going to heaven um, and regretting it, and before we're going to the judgment seat of Christ and regretting those, uh, the, the, those decisions that, that we made in this world, we need to work our lives right now for the Lord. Right? We need to please Him to the best of our abilities. Um, and this is where I want to uh, wrap up this uh, sermon. This is the ultimate conclusion. We know that there is a judgment seat of Christ, and as Christians, we will all be going there. But we need to think about this. When we go there, we're going to be judged according to our actions. If we don't have anything to show the Lord, then we're not going to be able to be um, really honored greatly in heaven by the Lord. With that being said, we need to live for the Lord now. But I want us to focus not on the great things, but on the small things. We need to start with the small things, and that's, that's really what's really important. Not the big things, but the small things. Let's remember, as Christians, we were once great sinners in God's sight, and we were living in this dirty world. But when I receive salvation, it's like finding a precious pearl in God's sight, right? God, he was able to find this precious pearl in the midst of this dirty world. And now, I'm able to, I receive salvation, I'm in the church, and I need to live for the Lord. If you think about it, everyone went through the same process that is in the church, everyone that is saved went through the same process, and so the brothers and sisters next to me are very, very precious, are very, very precious, and I need to serve them in the small things. That's where we need to start, right? We must do our best to serve and minister to one another. Let's not try to go overboard. We don't need to go do big things. We need to focus on the, the small things. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 to 40. I think on the screen it's a little bit small, the font, so please do find it in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40. This passage, likewise, is talking um, about the uh, judgment seat of Christ. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 40. Matthew 25, 34 to 40. Let me read here. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Verse 40, let's read together. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Once again, this is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Um, as I mentioned before, God, he will remember everything uh, that we did in this world uh, while he's judging us at the judgment seat of Christ. Now I want you to look at the person next to you. Uh, if you don't have anyone next to you, you could just look at, at, look at me. Um, do you know who is in that person? If it is a brother or sister, if it is a saved person, the person who is in that person, that brother or sister, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. We are all extremely valuable and precious in God's sight. And, and we are. We have Jesus Christ inside of us. And so when we serve the brothers and sisters, when we serve our fellow brethren, we're able to serve Christ. We're able to minister to Christ. Therefore, even doing the smallest thing for the person next to you is serving Christ the Lord. Right? This is very, very important. To serve the person next to us, however, it's very essential that we have a humble attitude. We have a meek heart. We need to make sure that we have the same mind towards one another. In Romans chapter 12, verse 15 and 16, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. Only the humble can do this. Let me give an example. and Let's just take a look at our state, what type of state that we are in. Um, if a brother or a sister, if someone is in the hospital and, and you go to the, their, their room, you look at them and what do you say? You say, yeah, you deserved it. Yeah, I remember you singing against God that one time. You, you deserve to be in the hospital. Is this what you say? No, we shouldn't do that, right? If they're weeping, we should weep with them. If they're rejoicing, um, let's, let's not talk about the hospital example anymore, but if they, are, if they are rejoicing, then we need to rejoice with them as well. We must associate, it says here in verse 16, with the humble. In other words, if we want to associate with the humble, then we first need to be humble ourselves. We cannot associate with the humble people unless we are humble ourselves. And so we must be able to humble ourselves and view each other in the same way. When we are able to do this, then we're able to serve them. If we are more humble than the person, our brothers or sisters, then we can serve them. However, if we are more arrogant, more prideful than the person next to us, our brothers and sisters, then it's very, very difficult to serve because we know that the, the person who is in the lower position serves the one who is in the higher position. We have to understand that we are all the same. We are all the same in that way. Right? We are not better than anyone else, um, nor is anyone worse than us. And sure, there may be differences in level of faith. Um, we do acknowledge that, but that doesn't mean we should neglect or look down on others. In Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 13, it says this, But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another, uh, another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. 
Um, the reason why Apostle Paul, he wrote this was because there were people that were judging other people. There were people that were showing contempt towards other people. Right? The strong sh um, showed contempt for the weak during this time, and the weak, they judged the strong. But this shouldn't be so, obviously, we know. The strong should uphold the weak, and the weak should follow the example of the strong. In Romans chapter 14, verse 15, it says, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with um, your food the one, whom for, uh, the one for whom Christ died. We need to make sure that we humble ourselves in front of each other and learn to serve one another. Once again, we must remember that Jesus Christ died for the brother and sister next to me as well. And so that is why they are very precious. I have, no, I have absolutely no right to judge or to look down on other brothers or sisters. I need to serve them. I need to love them. And so, um, in, in Romans chapter 14, in, in that example that we just saw in this passage here, there are people that boasted, saying, I have more faith than you. I'm, I'm better. I'm, I have higher um, faith than you. But if you have a lot of faith and you have no love, then that's a failing, that's a failing grade. Right? There is no point in having a lot of faith but no love. Right? We need to make sure that we truly love. If you want to be the, the people that are truly strong in their faith, those people are the people who humble themselves so that they can edify the brothers and sisters. They are the ones who don't stumble the people around them. And so getting back to this topic of small things, we need to make sure that we do the small thing. God, he doesn't expect very, very, very great big things from us in the beginning. Right? He wants to see the small things. He wants to see our heart put into those small things. Right? And so it doesn't matter what I do, whether it's big or small for Christ, I need to do that with my heart. And let's start with the small things so we don't have to really aim for the big things. Let me give a quick example here. Let's say that there was a father and he gave, um, he opened a bag of chips for his um, young children here, like, like these two uh, beautiful kids. And let's say that um, the father, he, he reaches out his hand and says, hey, can you, uh, can you guys give me one chip? Right? Give me one chip. Uh, there will be many different um, in different situations, right? Of course, depending on your children, uh, there may be some children who will, you know, hug or maybe put in their, the, the bag of chips right closer to their, their, their chest and say, oh, no, right? They'll just look at the father and just stare them down, right? There might be some kids like that, sure. Others will probably fish around into the bag and see, uh, look for the smallest piece of chip and then give it to the father. There might be others who give a, um, a handful of, of the chips to their father. And other people, other, other kids, they might give the whole bag back to their father. And in that situation, if the kid gave the whole bag of chips back to his father, do you think the father will say, yes, this is all mine, just devour it all? No, right? He's just going to be very pleased with the fact that his child gave him the chips. Right? And so he'll return it to him, saying, thank you. Oh, thank you, I know your heart now. This is very similar with God. God, he wants to see our heart. It doesn't matter how big, or it doesn't matter the, the size, right? It's, we have to make sure that we give him our heart and we start with those uh, small things. All we must do is give God the smallest things in our lives first. Right? We must live with this mindset. I want to give God the smallest of things first. Right? Giving to other people, right? Serving other brothers and sisters, this is a very small thing, right? For instance, giving a small cold, cold cup of water, this is a small thing. This will allow us to receive many rewards in heaven. Right? Maybe someone doesn't have a ride to church. We give them a ride to church. That's a small, rather small thing. Right? Uh, maybe encouraging brothers and sisters when they're in their difficulties. This is, it could be a small thing as well. Right? Rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. These type of things we need to start with. Right? Um, when it comes to the personal things in, in our Christian lives, uh, let's think about the basics. We, we learned about the basics throughout this series. Um, scriptures, prayer, fellowship, and evangelism. We need to do those things. And when we start with the basic, the small things, then the Lord, he will be truly pleased. And so while we live our lives, um, we have to understand that we need to give God the small things first. And while we live our Christian lives as well, we have to understand that, yes, we will fall. Um, that, that's almost guaranteed because we are all sinners. We will fall in God's and in front of God. But what God, he desires is for us not to stay down on the ground, but he desires for us to get back up. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16, it says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. If we truly are righteous, if we truly are saved Christians, then yes, we may fall, but we will get back up. Right? And that is what really pleases the Lord. 
And once again, if we return back to the analogy of, of, of the parent and the kid, if a kid falls, of course, the parents will be worried, but the parents will help the child back up right? and wait for the child to get back up. Right? That's what the parents would want. The parents wouldn't want the child to just lay on the floor and just stay there forever. Right? The parents will want to get the child back up, encourage the kids to get back up. And so we must live with this mindset that God is pleased when we get back up and always get back up and once again do those small things that will get us those rewards in heaven. And so um, in in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, I just want to end with this. We are um, talking about the judgment seat of Christ and this passage here once again does highlight the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. I do want to end with a, a rather stern type of a message here. It says, chapter 3, verse 15, If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. It would be very, very unfortunate if we were known as a person in heaven, as a person who was saved barely through fire. We are all saved by the fire, um, from the fire, rather, of hell, But wouldn't it be so embarrassing to be the one known as the one who was barely saved just through fire? We need to be doing more than that. The Lord, he has saved us from this great um, condemnation in hell, which is the reason why we need to live faithfully for him. And so today we learned about the judgment seat of Christ. Um, This is vastly different um, than the uh, great white throne judgment. And so uh, once again, if we can make sure that that is organized in our heads, that would be great uh, to sum up once again. The great white throne judgment is for sinners and the judgment seat of Christ is for saints, for Christians. Yes. Okay, let's put our hands together and let's pray. Heavenly and merciful Father God, We thank you for giving us the amazing grace of salvation and allowing us to become your children. Lord, we truly do thank you for allowing us to be in the church where we can learn more about your love and grace. God, we are very weak in front of you, but we know that you will always strengthen us if we rely on you. So please allow us to be those that have faith in you and just hold on to you and your words. Today we learned about the judgment seat of Christ and how we will all stand before you and we will all be judged according to the works that we have done in this world. So we ask, Lord, that you can make it our aim. Allow us to be ambitious to be well-pleasing to you so that we can really glorify your name and receive many rewards in heaven. Please do guide us uh, throughout the remainder of our lives and allow us to always be vigilant, always be awake so that uh, we can live faithfully for you. Uh, We thank you for all the things that you have given to us and we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.